Thanks, everyone, for being here. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to share my views on the economy and monetary policy. It's actually a very opportune time for me to be here. Um, the Federal Open Market Committee, the monetary policy-making body within the Fed, meets in less than two weeks. Traveling to Pittsburgh allows me to hear firsthand from people in this part of the 4th Federal Reserve District, which comprises Western Pennsylvania, Ohio, Eastern Kentucky, and the Northern Panhandle of West Virginia. Of course, as an economist, I look at data and economic models to help formulate my views, but the information on emerging issues that the Cleveland Fed staff and I gather directly from contacts throughout the district is also very important in assessing how the economy is doing. The FOMC spends considerable time discussing regional economic conditions at our meetings, and this information from all across the country helps us set national monetary policy. In addition to providing an opportunity to hear from you, my talk today also lets me explain my views on monetary policy. Congress has given the Fed its monetary policy goals of maximum employment and price stability. At the same time, Congress has also wisely granted the Fed independence in setting monetary policy in pursuit of those goals, meaning that policy decisions are insulated from short-run political considerations. But accountability must go hand in hand with that independence, and I call this accountable independence. In order for the public and Congress to have the information they need to hold the Fed accountable for monetary policy decisions, it's important for Fed policymakers to regularly communicate their views. So I do value this time with you today. Now at this point, it's probably a good idea to remind people that the views I'll provide today are my own and not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve System or my colleagues on the Federal Open Market Committee. That may become apparent in a moment. The economic expansion is now in its ninth year, one of the longest on record. But as everyone knows, age does not always indicate maturity. It's good to remember that the economy had to climb out of a very deep hole after the financial crisis and Great Recession, and it took some time for the expansion to gain traction. Of course, there have been some ups and downs along the journey. Our thoughts are with the people in Texas and along the Gulf Coast and all those coping with the destruction in the wake of Hurricane Harvey and preparing for the next Hurricane Irma. We are gathering information from our contacts, but it's still too early to assess the full economic impact of the storm. Experience suggests that soon after the storm passes, cleanup and rebuilding begin, oil refineries are assessed and brought back online, and shipping channels reopen. These are huge undertakings, and I expect we will see fortitude and resilience as this work proceeds. One hope is that the underlying fundamentals supporting the economy remain sound. These fundamentals include accommodative monetary policy and financial conditions, a stronger U.S. banking system, improved household balance sheets and income growth, continued strength in the U.S. labor market, and improving conditions in the economies of our trading partners. Over the expansion, output growth has maintained a moderate pace of a bit more than 2% on average. And I anticipate that GDP will expand over the next year or so at a pace somewhat above trend, which I estimate at 2%. The hurricane in the Gulf will likely dampen economic activity in the current quarter, with subsequent rebuilding efforts adding to growth in subsequent quarters. Although storms like Harvey and Irma are atypical, thank goodness, Quarterly variation in the data is not unusual. Consumer spending, which makes up over two-thirds of output, slowed in the first quarter but picked up in the second quarter. The outlook for household spending remains sound. Readings on consumer sentiment and confidence remain high. But more important for spending, personal incomes are growing because labor markets continue to improve. Household balance sheets are in much better shape since the Great Recession reflecting a combination of deleveraging and increased savings, 
coupled with cumulative increases in stock and house prices. Although not true for every homeowner, in the aggregate, the equity households have in housing is now back to what it was at the peak. The recovery in the housing market has taken some time. Buyers, sellers, developers, and bankers were all wary about re-entering the market, and rightfully so, given the fallout from the housing bust. But with support from low interest rates and the improved financial condition of households and lenders, we've seen a gradual increase in housing construction and sales over the expansion. In some places, demand for housing is outpacing supply, putting upward pressure on home prices, which are rising at about a 6% pace on average nationally. Overall, I expect activity in the housing sector to continue ex to expand at a sustainable pace. An encouraging sign in the, account, in the economy is the strengthening in business activity and investment this year after subdued readings in 2015 and 2016. In recent years, oil prices and the value of the dollar have been important influences on business spending. You'll recall that there was a sharp drop in oil prices from over $100 a barrel in mid-2014 to around $30 in early 2016. This led to a sharp pullback in activity in the mining and drilling sector and its suppliers, including the steel industry. At the same time, a sharp 20% appreciation of the dollar hurt manufacturers and other firms dependent on exports. Since then, conditions supporting business spending have improved. The rebound in oil prices to around $50 a barrel and the rise in natural gas prices have spurred a strong recovery in mining and drilling activity. The modest appreciation in the dollar over the second half of 2016 and depreciation since the start of this year reflect improved conditions in the economies in our trading partners. This has led to a pickup in U.S. manufacturing activity and in our exports to other countries. Currently, business sentiment remains at high levels and supportive of continued spending. But some of my business contacts report that mounting political and fiscal policy uncertainty has begun to temper some of that optimism. There are even some scattered reports from a few firms that they're delaying some of their planned investment until the picture becomes clearer. We need to keep a watch on whether this wait and see attitude spreads and begins to weigh more broadly on spending and investment decisions. A pullback on investments in physical and human capital or in research and development leading to innovations would be particularly troubling because these investments can have a positive effect on productivity growth which measures how effectively the economy combines its labor and capital inputs to make output. Productivity growth is a key determinant of an economy's longer run growth rate and of living standards. But the US economy has been struggling with very low productivity growth. Over the expansion, annual growth in labor productivity measured by output per hour work in the non-farm business sector has averaged 1%. This is a step down from the two and a quarter to two and a half percent pace seen over the prior two expansions. Low productivity growth, coupled with slower growth of the labor force, helps to explain why trend economic growth rate, which I estimate at 2%, is lower than the three to three and a half percent rate seen over the 1980s and 1990s. It also helps to explain why the acceleration in wages since 2013 has been relatively subdued despite the strength we've seen in labor markets and reports of shortages of qualified workers in many occupations. As the economic expansion has progressed, firms have been adding people to their payrolls. So far this year, job increases have averaged 176,000 per month, a bit under last year's pace. This rate exceeds most estimates of trend in employment growth, which fall in the range of 75,000 to 120,000 per month. The unemployment rate peaked at 10% after the Great Recession, but as the economy has added jobs at an above trend pace, the unemployment rate moved down. For the past five months, the unemployment rate has stabilized with monthly readings bouncing between 4.3 and 4.4%. The rate is now essentially at the lowest level reached during the last expansion. 
Of course, to gauge labor market conditions, we look at more than payroll employment growth in this headline measure of the unemployment rate. We examine a broad set of indicators, including job opening and turnover rates, and broader measures of the unemployment rate, such as those that include the number of part-time workers who would rather work full-time, and the number of people who have been discouraged from looking for a job. These measures also indicate that substantial progress has been made in the labor market. Although we may see a weaker payroll employment number for September due to the hurricanes, I expect that labor market conditions will remain healthy and that over the next year the unemployment rate will stay below four and three quarter percent, my current estimate of its longer run rate. Granted, there's considerable uncertainty around estimates of the longer run unemployment rate. The relatively modest acceleration in wages from under 2% earlier in the expansion to 2 and a quarter to 2.5% in recent quarters suggests to some that there's still considerable slack in labor markets and that the longer run unemployment rate is lower than the current rate. For me, a more salient factor in the relatively slow growth in wages is the low level of productivity growth. Firms in, have indicated to us that there isn't much slack in the labor market, and we're hearing more frequent reports from our labor and business context across a broad set of industries that businesses are having trouble finding qualified workers, both in high-skill occupations and in lower-skill jobs. Some of these firms report they're responding by raising wages and offering other benefits to attract and retain workers. These increases should eventually find their way into the aggregate compensation measures, but unless productivity growth picks up, I wouldn't expect to see a strong acceleration in wages. So my assessment is that from the standpoint of the cyclical conditions that monetary policy can address, we have reached the maximum employment part of the Fed's monetary policy mandate. At the same time, there are some longer run structural issues in the labor market that cannot be addressed by monetary policy, but that the country must tackle. Technological advances and globalization are changing the nature of available jobs and the skill sets needed to perform those jobs. While the overall economy will eventually benefit from these forces, many individuals and some regions are adversely affected by these structural trends. Government policies and programs and public-private partnerships can and should be brought to bear to help people gain the skills needed for jobs in the modern economy and to help communities make the transition. This is already happening in Pittsburgh. The Allegheny Conference on Community Development has published an in-depth analysis of the expected supply and demand for labor in the Pittsburgh region over the next decade and has made a number of recommendations to help the region prepare for the coming changes. The study drew on some of the work being conducted by the Federal Reserve System's community development function. And in October, the Fed will hold a capstone conference on a collaborative initiative that is focused on reframing workforce development efforts as investments, allowing for larger scale solutions with increased accountability for outcomes. Now, price stability is the other part of the Fed's mandate. Inflation has, has its ups and downs over the expansion. It's moved up from the very low level seen in 2015 when it was held down by falling oil and import prices. But the last couple of readings were on the weak side and inflation continues to run below the Fed's goal of 2%. The year-over-year -year increase in PC inflation stood at 1.4% in July up from about 1% a year ago. Most people understand why high inflation is a problem. It erodes the purchasing power of their money. But inflation that's too low is also a problem. It can lead consumers and businesses to delay purchases, and it increase debt burdens, either of which could slow the economy. In assessing where we are relative to the inflation goal, it's always a good idea to look through temporary movements in the numbers, both those above and those below our goal, and focus on where inflation is going on a sustained basis. For example, when assessing the underlying trend in inflation, we should look through a temporary increase in gasoline prices stemming from disruptions caused by Hurricane Harvey. 
Similarly, some of the weakness in recent inflation reports reflect special factors, like the drop in the prices of pre prescription drugs and cell phone service plans earlier in the year. It may take a couple more months for these factors to work themselves through, but these types of price declines aren't signaling a general downward trend in consumer prices from weak demand. Instead, they reflect supply-side factors and relative price changes. At the same time, we need to recognize that weak inflation num numbers, no matter what the source, can become a problem if they start to undermine the public's expectations about future inflation. If inflation expectations were to become unanchored and began steadily declining, it would be much more difficult to raise inflation back to the Fed's goal. I don't expect the economy to get to that point. And my current assessment is that inflation will remain below our goal for somewhat longer, but that the conditions remain in place for inflation to gradually return over the next year or so to our symmetric goal of 2% on a sustained basis. These conditions include growth that's expected to be at or slightly above trend, continued strength in the labor market, and reasonably stable inflation expectations. We need to recognize that there are risks around any inflation projection, both upside risk, considering the current and future expected strength in labor markets, and downside risk, given the softness in recent inflation readings. In fact, inflation is difficult to forecast. Stu can attest to that fact. Based on historical forecast errors, over the past 20 years, a 70% confidence range for forecasts a PC inflation one year ahead is plus or minus one percentage point. And a significant portion of the variation in inflation rates comes from idiosyncratic factors that can't be forecasted. Indeed, since the 1990s, assuming that inflation will return to 2% over the next one to two years has been one of the most accurate forecasts. In the recent period, this is perhaps a testament to the importance of well-anchored inflation expectations and of the FOMC's commitment to its 2% symmetric inflation goal. In any case, I will be scrutinizing incoming data on inflation and inflation expectations and the reports from my business contacts to help me assess the inflation outlook. As I mentioned at the start of my talk, evaluating regional economic conditions plays an important role in setting national monetary policy. So let me spend a few minutes discussing the Pittsburgh area economy. For some time, this region's economy has been transitioning from one that's largely dependent on steel, coal mining, and heavy industry to one that's diversifying into healthcare, education, financial services, and technology. This is a promising development because regions that remain dependent on one particular industry have fared less well over time than those that have been able to diversify their industrial bases and adapt to changing economic forces. Nonetheless, Pittsburgh's industrial mix and the types of shocks that hit the economy played a role in how the area has fared over the expansion. The Great Recession took its toll on the region, but Pittsburgh was an early achiever in the expansion. In 2012, Pittsburgh was one of the first major US metropolitan areas to see payroll jobs move back up to pre-Great Recession levels. The US as a whole didn't achieve that milestone until mid-2014, and Pennsylvania not until 2015. The unemployment rate in the Pittsburgh metro area peaked at around 8.5% in 2010, and had fallen to about 5.25% by the end of 2014. But the decline in energy prices and the appreciation of the dollar in 2014 to 2016 took a toll on the region, causing a contraction in energy exploration and production and steel production. Though job losses in these sectors were offset by continued increases in service sector jobs, the unemployment rate began to rise. The good news is that once energy prices and the dollar stabilized, the unemployment rate began falling again to its current level of just over 5%, and overall employment began growing again. Certain sectors are still losing jobs, but the pace of job cuts, cuts in mining and drilling has slowed, and job cuts in manufacturing have stabilized. 
Losses in these sectors are being more than offset by gains in the service sector, where we see relatively strong growth in scientific R&D jobs in the metro area. As I mentioned earlier, the FOMC will be meeting later this month to discuss the economy and decide on monetary policy. We'll also be releasing a new round of economic projections, something we do four times a year. Based on the economic outlook and risks around the outlook, the FOMC has begun to normalize the stance of monetary policy by removing some of the extraordinary accommodation that was necessary in the wake of the financial crisis and Great Recession. Appropriate adjustments in monetary policy are those that will sustain the expansion, not curtail it, so that our long-run goals of price stability and maximum employment are met and maintained. Now, because we know that it takes some time for monetary policy to work itself through the economy, we can't wait until these policy goals are fully met to act. We need to assess what incoming information is telling us about where the economy is going over the median run and the risks around that median run outlook and set policy appropriately. In my view, if economic conditions evolve as anticipated, I believe further removal of accommodation via gradual increases in the Fed funds rate will be needed and will help sustain the expansion. A gradual removal of accommodation helps avoid a buildup of risk to macroeconomic stability that could arise if the economy is allowed to overheat, as well as risk to financial stability if interest rates remain too low encouraging investors to take on excessively risky investments in a search for yield or engendering other financial imbalances. The gradual approach to normalization allows for the kind of fluctuations we've seen in the data on the economy and inflation without having to change our strategy. I see this consistency as a positive in that it underscores our systematic approach to monetary policy and it removes policy ambiguity at a time when uncertainty seems to be rising on other fronts. It's important to notice that the gradual path I anticipate does not entail an increase at each FOMC meeting. At its July meeting, the FOMC decided to maintain the target range for the Fed funds rate at one to one and a quarter percent. It also announced that economic conditions are expected to evolve in a way that will warrant further gradual increases. The pace of those increases will depend on what incoming information tells us about the median run outlook. Normalizing the stance of monetary policy also means taking steps to normalize the Fed's balance sheet in terms of the size and composition of assets. To address the Great Recession, the Fed undertook several programs to purchase longer-term assets, including longer maturity treasuries and agency mortgage-backed securities. These purchases aim to put downward pressure on longer-term interest rates once the FOMC's traditional policy tool, the Fed funds rate, had been reduced to effectively zero. As a result of the purchases, the Fed's balance sheet grew from nearly $900 billion in assets in 2007, or 6% of nominal GDP, to about $4.5 trillion today, or 23% of nominal GDP. In addition, the composition of the Fed's assets has changed from mainly short-term Treasury securities to mainly longer maturity Treasuries and agency MBS. In tandem with the increase in Fed assets, there was a sizable increase in Fed liabilities, namely depository institution deposits or reserves held at the Fed. Reserves have increased from about $11 billion in 2007 to over $2 trillion today. In October 2014, the Fed stopped the program to increase the size of its balance sheet. But since then, we've been reinvesting the returns from maturing securities, thereby maintaining the balance sheet's large size. The FOMC's intention is to reduce the size of the balance sheet over time to the smallest size needed to implement monetary policy efficiently and effectively, and in the longer run to hold primarily Treasury securities. In June, the FOMC described its program for normalizing the balance sheet by gradually reducing the amount of reinvestments it's making in a predictable way. 
The gradual predictable decline allows balance sheet normalization to run in the background and monetary policy to focus on setting the appropriate level of the Fed funds rate, our conventional monetary policy tool. The FOMC expects to begin implementing the program relatively soon, and I favor doing this in the near future. First, by design, it will be a very gradual process of decreasing the amount of assets reinvested each month, with balance sheet normalization taking several years. Second, the plan has been well telegraphed in advance. Both of these aspects make it less likely that we'll see a sudden or sizable increase in long-term yields as a result of the announcement of the start of the implementation. Indeed, in my view, other factors, including the ongoing discussions about the debt ceiling, rising geopolitical tensions, and political uncertainty would be more likely to influence Treasury yields in the near term. Regarding the ultimate size of the balance sheet, we know the balance sheet will be larger than it was prior to the financial crisis for the simple reason that the public's demand for currency is rising over time. But it will also likely be considerable smaller than it is today. How much smaller depends on how the FOMC decides to implement monetary policy in the future. But because it will take several years to reduce the size of the balance sheet through asset runoff, there's no reason to delay the start of normalization until this decision is made. As a final remark, it's important to remind everyone that there are risks around the economic outlook. And because of that, monetary policy is not preset. The confidence bands the FOMC is now providing around its economic and policy path projections are visual reminders to both the public and to policymakers themselves that there's always a lot of uncertainty around economic forecasts. Policy needs to remain systematic in how it reacts to incoming information relative to the outlook, but not be dogmatic should the outlook indeed materially change. That said, I view the steps the FOMC is taking to gradually normalize monetary policy, both the Fed funds rate and the balance sheet, as a welcome acknowledgement that the economy itself has normalized. Thank you for your kind attention. I'm happy to take questions. In fact, I look forward to it. How do you see the increasing use of cyber currency, such as Bitcoin, affecting open market uh, operations? So currently there's an effort going on at the Federal Reserve where we're a project to, to move to fa faster payments and more secure payment system. Um, and the Fed released a paper about its next steps on that project. Certainly these kind of currencies are something that are under study at the Fed. There's no intention of issuing currency at this point, but we do think it's something that's worthwhile studying, and that's part of what the ongoing work at the Fed is. In the near term, it's not going to affect our monetary policy. What are your thoughts on uh, a rules-based approach to monetary policy like advocated by Heritage Foundation and others, John Taylor, the Taylor Rule, et cetera? Right. So I think that policy needs to be systematic in how it reacts to incoming information to the extent it, it affects the media run outlook. I do look at a number of policy rules as a preparation for my going into the FOMC meeting. I think they're a good benchmark which to evaluate where we are relative to the rules. And in fact, the Cleveland Fed posts on its website um, a set of, of policy rules so that people can look at where they are and look at them relative to FOMC projections, et cetera. And, and you could even put in your, there's a spreadsheet, so if you have your favorite rule, you can put it in and generate it through different forecasts. What you'll see if you actually look at that website, and I would encourage you all to do it, is that depending on which rule you take, you get a different policy path. Now, you could take the median of that policy path, and you know, incidentally, it looks very close to what the FOMC's policy path is, um, which I think is a good gauge for my own thinking. 
But you, there's, the state of the art is not such that you could pick one rule and it would dominate. So while I really am very strongly an advocate of systematic policy and you know, being very systematic in what we look at and how we evaluate the economy, um, I don't think that we're at the point where you can pick one rule and set it on autopilot and, and do policy that way. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for your time today. Do you have any theories on why productivity growth uh, is stuck where it's at and, and what might be done to help uh, get productivity growth growing again? So certainly that's a, a very important question and there's a lot of work going on. I mean, my own feeling is that one of the big issues is that the Great Recession was great in a bad way. It was very, very deep. It was very, very broad. It was very, very prolonged. And the recovery, again, was prolonged. If you look at investment, investment was very, very slow to recover. And of course, we know that investment is a very important part of generating productivity growth. So I, you know, we've had space of low productivity growth in the past. We haven't had such a bad recession. And I think part of it's due to that. There's also structural change going on in the economy. And so some of it may be we're not measuring it correctly. But I think there's something deeper than just a measurement issue. Um, we have seen in the recent you know, couple of quarters a, a slight pickup in productivity growth. Um, I think there are things that we could do to um, make sure that we are making investments in both capital um, and human capital that will make us more productive going forward. Um, there are some things that you could do on the regulatory side that perhaps would increase productivity growth. I don't think there's a silver bullet that says, you know, if we do corporate tax reform, all of a sudden we're going to get a big surge in productivity growth. I don't think that's the way it works, but there are small things that you can do. Um, I am concerned about the fact that we have had underinvestment for quite a while. I'm very gratified that this year we're seeing a pickup in that investment. And I think that's the kind of thing that we're going to need to see in order to get productivity back up. And you know, hopefully it'll continue and we'll see that gradual pick up to levels that you know, we'd like to see it. But you're, you've hit on the right question. That's going to be very, a quintessential question for the future. I wonder if um, I could put you on the spot for a second, change topics away from monetary policy and talk about wages, and specifically minimum wage. Um, and I'm surprised that, personally surprised that it sort of hasn't entered the public debate um, in a very broad way given income inequality that we're seeing, given pressures in uh, student debt, mm -hmm. um, your own comments on wage inflation broadly. and. I guess if you could sort of speak to your own thoughts on that, and then separately, irrespective of whether you think it's a good idea or a bad idea to raise it, work through, what if we doubled it? How does it play through in the economy um, to the good or bad of which side? And, and just your comments on that broadly. Right. I mean, there's a lot of work on minimum wage. There's a lot of studies on minimum wage. In fact, one of my colleagues, when I was a grad student at Princeton, did one of the big studies on the effects of minimum wage. Um, and depending on how it's implemented and in what level, it can have an effect on incomes. But the other problem is it also affects job, jobs. So it's not an either or, right? It's gonna affect both demand and supply for jobs. And there's a lot of mixed results on whether it actually benefits the people um, that are you know, gonna be the recipients of it. It also depends on what level it is. So you could imagine setting a minimum wage that like, is right at sort of a little bit above the poverty level, and maybe that's a way of doing a minimum income. Right, because you know, one of the one of the ways to address, or that some countries have tried to address income inequality, is, is by setting a minimum income level for people, independent of whether they have a job or not. You could imagine using the minimum wage in that way, but you also have to recognize that there's federal minimum wages and state minimum wages, and part of the issue is right. You know, you could change one of them, and if your state has a higher one, it's not going to have any impact on your state or your region. So again, it's a much more complicated issue. 
than just saying, oh, we raise the minimum wage, everything will be great, right? Because you're, you're, you're basically moving money from one party to another, right? You're not necessarily creating more money. Um, there are probably other ways to address income inequality um, through tax code changes that might be more um, efficacious than raising the minimum wage. But in general, I think the, the issue you're hitting on is, is income inequality an issue for the country? I wholly agree that it is. Um, and, I is, and I do think it's something that we need to be thinking about very seriously about ways to address that. I guess. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm good. To dovetail with with Bill's question, what about universal basic income, and your thoughts on that yeah. relative to that whole inequality question? Okay, so I find that an intriguing idea. Um, I think it would be very hard to get there. Um, it didn't pass in Switzerland, and if it didn't pass in Switzerland, I think it's harder to get it here. Um, and I think, again, it's one of these things that sounds good, but you've got to look at the details of how you'd implement it. Um, you know, I think there's things that have been done through the U.S. tax code, you know, like earned income tax credits and things like that, that have that kind of flavor. But there's probably more efficient ways of doing it. But again, I think, you know, until you actually see what the plan would be, it's hard to say anything more than I think it's something to think about. I think it's very hard to get there from where we are. Thank you. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the Fed's balance sheet, the factors that go into your decision making about the speed of reducing it. Right. With interest rates being at, seems to be almost record lows, why not take advantage of that environment to reduce the balance sheet faster? Yeah. I mean, as you can tell from the minutes of the FOMC meetings, this is something that we've talked about over several meetings before we came out with the plan in June. Um, and I think the basic idea was we wanted to have a plan that we really could say, you know, set it and forget it, you know. So basically once we get the plan started, you know, we start implementing it, we don't want to keep revisiting it. And the thought was if we do it in a gradual and very predictable way and announce it well in advance so that market participants and the public would understand that we're doing this, we wouldn't have to come back and revisit it. And so that was kind of the intention going in. And then the details of it, you know, we just kind of looked at sort of what the past would be in terms of the outflows and giving the schedule. You know, the treasuries, or everyone can sit down with a piece of paper and, and sort of see what that's going to be. The MBS is going to depend on prepayments and things. But again, you know, people have models of that. And so again, the idea, the thought process was let's set something that's, you know, a reasonably predictable, gradual, decline, yes, it's going to take a few years to get it down, but something that we would not have to be revisiting at every meeting, and then put the focus on the fund rate as our po primary policy tool. And that was the thought process. And in June, we came out with a schedule so that people would understand. Um, so basically, what we're doing is we're saying we're not going to, we're going to basically gradually reduce the amount of reinvestments we're doing and have the assets run off in a gradual way. Sure. Or two. Likes the Q &A. I do like the Q and I like to hear what's on people's mind because this helps me think about the economy. So you're helping me out here. Thank you very much for speaking to us today. Um, my question is, uh, what's the number one thing that keeps you up at night or, or worries <laughs> you with regard to uh, you know the Fed starting to normalize interest rate policy? <sighs> So I'm a bad sleeper uh, in general. Um, yeah, exactly. I think we're all bad sleepers these days. Um, look, I think the Fed's on a good path in terms of the normalization. I want to see it continue. I think we're doing it at a slow enough pace. I mean, the one thing that has, a, one thing that I just want to be clear, you know, the gradual pace sort of already incorporates the fact that inflation is below our target, you know, and that, you know, the unemployment rate is, you know, moved down to, you know, levels that we could say are full employment, right? And sort of balances these kind of, well, maybe inflation's a little lower for a little bit longer than we might have thought. 
and maybe you know the unemployment rate could come down a little bit more and or maybe not you know depending we're, we're trying to balance all these things together and in turn also with financial markets you know maybe there's <clears throat> some frothiness in the financial markets etc that gradual path allows for that kind of if we had started out on a strategy that had a very sharp trajectory for the funds rate we would have had to be moving that right around much more than we've sort of the minor adjustments we made to the past. So what I like about the, the gradual path is that it allows us to be very consistent in our strategy over time and allow for some of the variation, the normal variation that we see in economic data. And that's why I'm sort of saying that, look, we started down this path. Um, you know, I think we've been very clear on the balance sheet. I think we've been very transparent in what our intentions for the funds rate is. And yeah, we got a couple of weak inflation readings, but that gradual path sort of allows for that. And so that's why I'm sort of a proponent of let's stick on that path and have some consistency in our policy over time. Getting back to the first question, like I think consistency here is a good thing. Whenever we do forecasting, whenever we have, look, we have two hurricanes, who would have predicted how strong they would have been? Who knows? We don't even know the trajectory yet of Irma. There's a lot of uncertainty in the world. And so you do have to be willing to sort of shift policy as needed if the economy changes materially. At this point, you know, I don't see that. But I think those are the kinds of things that you have to look through. Then there's longer run issues, some of the things we've talked about here today, income inequality, productivity growth, are we investing in our future human resources the way we should be? Are we making sure that we have sufficient workers um, to do the jobs in the modern economy as the economy transitions? Technological change means that we're going to see more, more of that. Are we prepared for that? I think those longer run issues are things that we need to tackle. and. Because they're longer issues, they're easy to put off to the future. But I think we better start really seriously thinking about those things. And so when I'm up late at night thinking, those are the kind of long run issues that I, that I try to think about. Because I think those are the ones that we need to think about for the future of the country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank me. Thank, let me ask you to thank uh, Loretta for her very Really clear 